welcome to this episode of Life with Lizzie Lee. Joining me today is Mr. George Wutk, President of European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for inviting me. So I want to, I want to start by asking if you can tell me a little bit about your personal history of engagement with China. Uh, from your point of view, what has been the most prominent feature of the current era in terms of doing business in China? Well, actually, in the end of next week, I have my 40th anniversary. I arrived 40 years ago by train from Germany uh, in summer of 1982, and I lived on and off here for 35 years. So I'm one of those fossils. Uh, of course, uh, to me, in this respect, uh, the era of Xi Jinping is uh, important, but it's just 10 out of 40 years. I've also witnessed the opening up of uh, Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enji in particular, economically as well as politically. And uh, of course, the, the sense that we have from this administration is that it's more of a closing up, more uh, going into a self-reliance. Uh, so the, the major difference for business, of course, on the upside was the president's fight against corruption that has really made our life better. Secondly, of course, as a private citizen and as a businessman, uh, the clearing of the skies, uh, we had incredible pollution in China, in particular in Beijing, and he has really made a difference and an effort there. So uh, we are very keen also to see where 2030 peak of carbon 2060 will head right. But otherwise, of course, uh, we're very distressed about the zero tolerance policy, the kind of closing up of the country, and we see no end to it. Right. And we see in the media that there seems to be some chatter that there's this uh, ongoing shift in the way that foreign business are perceived and treated by uh, Chinese government. Do you get the sense that China is going back to a more fundamentalist, socialist model of, of economic, man uh, economic management in Xi Jinping's era? Well, clearly, access to the market was always very difficult. Uh, the European Chamber was founded in 2000 with the sole purpose of actually trying to help opening up. Of course, there was a different spirit and a different uh, kind of vibe in uh, 2000, uh, 2001 when China joined WTO. And we have noticed quite an opening up drive afterwards. But since about 2005, certainly since 2010, it becomes a little bit more closed up and uh, also a touch of nationalism uh, is being detected there. Um, so in a, in a way, actually, uh, foreign business is established here, uh, but in a way that no newcomers are uh, coming into the country. That's a notable fact that uh, smaller sized companies in Europe look at China and say, oh, it's not worth it, too difficult. I go to Thailand, Philippines, or other countries. So the way it sits, like it's an established game. The big boys are here. Most of them are successful. The other ones partly are struggling. But where this all is going to lead, certainly in times of dual circulation, self-reliance, and the kind of creeping nationalism is very hard to read uh, between the fault lines. Right. And during your term of office, you have interacted with uh, Chinese officials across, across different bureaucratic levels. Do you get the sense that there is a critical mass of pro-market, pro-reform bureaucrats who are kind of pushing against some of the more fundamentalist economic agenda, top down from Beijing leadership, as you mentioned? How much sway do you think they have in steering policies in uh, your more pro-market directions? Yeah, for most people, it's just uh, China has one voice. It's the Communist Party, and uh, uh, and uh, that dis disclosed itself in in Rim and Ripa on China Daily and whatnot. But as a matter of fact, uh, it's quite diverse. I wouldn't say it's Fifty Shades of Grey, but pretty much a very diverse uh, uh, view on how the economy uh, has to be run. Um, so in a way, you are, yes, you have those that actually want to uh, put up higher borders. Uh, then there are those in the middle that actually, I would say, is the present administration to a large extent uh, trying to cherry pick uh, who can go in and who can participate. And there are those, of course, who know that uh, an opening up of China will mean stronger growth, better competition, more quality and growth and so forth. I would name the person Liu He as one of them, the vice premier, but also Prime Minister Li Keqiang, uh, who I met in May. Uh, personally, uh, has indicated that there has to be a stronger reform push. So the way, again, the party rules uh, and uh, you have people that are trying to push the envelope. Uh, it's possibly baby steps from their side. It's important for us that we have allies like this. Um, but overall, of course, uh, the atmosphere has far more, has been far more ideological and rich uh, over the last uh, five to 10 years. Right. And I want to turn to the uh, CAI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, a little bit. Um, it has been on the back burner for a while, actually. Uh, do you think there's any chance it will be rectified soon by the European Parliament? Or more broadly, do you see a path for China and Europe to sort of disentangle trade and investment discussions from human rights concerns? Or should 
EU business has been more proactively pushing back against some of the Chinese abuses in human rights areas. Well, we were so happy in December 2020 when it was eventually signed after all seven years of negotiations. And of course, it was very distressing to see that uh, uh, in March it was put on the back burner by the European Parliament. Uh, I would say rightfully so, because uh, five parliamentarians were sanctions. And of course, you had all kinds of sanctions on think tanks and, and individuals. Uh, the sanctions from the Chinese side were definitely outsized. But uh, I hate sanctions in the first place. But never mind. The, the investment agreement, I think, clearly is in the deep freezer for a long period of time. Um, even if uh, these five uh, individuals will be uh, seeing the sanctions lifted, uh, there will be no major change because it's all about Xinjiang. It's all about human rights. And I see very little uh, room for a compromise uh, between China, between Beijing and Brussels and the member states. Uh, so in a way, it will, be, it will be a thorn in the side of both regions. Um, it will be uh, very difficult for European companies to operate in because we have new supply chain laws coming up. Certainly, we are also impacted by the Uyghur uh, Act uh, that came out in the US recently. It becomes just more tedious and difficult to conduct business. And uh, many companies have already left the Xinjiang region or the supply chain uh, because they can't prove that there are forced labor in their supply chain. So, yes, um, it's, it's going to be more difficult. But you can operate in China, you can actually have factories in Xinjiang if you can uh, prove it that uh, you have uh, uh, basically you conducted international norms. Uh, but proving means it has to be a third international accredited auditor who does that. Uh, if you just run around and say, you know, I'm clean, it doesn't help. I see. I want to turn to international affairs a little bit. How has Russia's invasion of Ukraine changed the sentiment among EU business community toward China? Yeah, it, it came at a peculiar period of time. I mean, it was uh, end of February and uh, Putin invaded Ukraine and we had a Shanghai lockdown. It was really a double whammy. Uh, we put a, a study out that shows uh, two black swans uh, as things that we never thought is going to happen. Um, the result in the survey done in May was very clear that uh, European business uh, sees a correlation between Ukraine and uh, the situation over here. The word Taiwan always pops up. Um, I think that's unnecessary. I really don't see that uh, there's any imminent danger of a real blockade of war in Taiwan. But the fact is that headquarters see it like this. And uh, of course, um, the actions of the Chinese Navy uh, and army around Taiwan were not, certainly not helpful either. So in a way, uh, Russia has dented the view on China. Uh, people talk about diversification, but there's also a different view on that. If you talk to the top managers of European companies here, they don't actually see it as a major problem, but the headquarters clearly are under a lot of pressure from public opinion, parliaments, NGOs, media, and so on and so on. And they clearly take action there. Um, we can see that European companies are not leaving China, but we see that European companies are considering to put the money elsewhere in Asia, and figures already prove it. Right. Um, at this point, it seems Xi Jinping is, you know, all but secured to have an unprecedented third term. Are you concerned about the direction the country is currently going? More generally, how should foreign investors and business people adjust to the new reality of the Xi Jinping era in China? Well, it's nothing new. I mean, uh, the man was in office now for 10 years and he's going to get his third term for sure. So in a way, there will be not much changes. Uh, if anything we learn from history is that people long time in office actually harden their stance rather than loosening it up. Um, and uh, so I guess that it will be more of the same. Uh, there will be more control. But of course, what actually really uh, concerns foreign companies now is the strong stance on zero tolerance. Uh, you can see the world has found its way back uh, living with the Omicron uh, virus, whereas here uh, I have to get tested every three days. I'm trying to fly to Chongqing tomorrow. I'm not sure if I'm going to actually end up in quarantine either in Chongqing, Chengdu, or when I come back in Beijing. It's a bit of a, a, a strange situation that uh, it's, it's hard to travel within China. So in a way, is it going to change? It has to change. But China cannot open up the borders now. They are vaccine naive. They have no herd immunity. It would be irresponsible to open up now. But actually, what the European business community wants is strong vaccinations. We have to find a way out of this. And I don't see any exit strategy. 
If you enjoy our discussions here, I'm sure you would find value in our new powerful marketplace tool for investors, also called China Edge. It tracks, distills, and analyzes both Chinese language and English language materials about Chinese companies, business leaders, and government entities, and reviews the often hidden links between them. For our YouTube viewers, we are offering a limited time 50% discount. Just go to the link you see on the screen and use the code. Edge fifty. Also, sign up for the China Edge newsletter. It's a daily two-minute rundown of China business news you don't want to miss. The link is right here on the screen. You can also click on the link in the video's description section to get your complimentary subscription today.